I'm Rosie Richmond. And I'm Peg Nofel. Welcome to Works in Progress, a show where writers read and viewers listen. In order to fulfill Sangamon State University's public affairs mandate, we have invited a special guest tonight, famous University of Illinois Bachelor of Arts Q Synopsis and his attorney, John Casey Maline. Gentlemen, it's all yours. Character was a word on a chalkboard. She perceived the world around her as a straight line, a razor's horizon with neither sky above nor sea below. There were three other words, but she could not read them, viewing them as she was from their edge. From the side, the word plot looked like this. From above, setting looked like this. And from below, theme in perfect cursive looked like this. Character was dissatisfied. She longed for some chain reaction, some turn of circumstance to change the way she perceived the world around her. Such was her youth. She did not realize that the development she longed for would be irreversible. The unanticipated events would cause an unanticipated response, which, if it dealt effectively with the unanticipated events, would become the anticipated response to future unanticipated events. In her undeveloped state, character was perfect. The plot realized that character had existed before the story began and would continue to exist after the story ended, unless she were to, unfortunately, be erased. Whereas the plot had begun with and would end with the story. This frustrated the plot's attempts towards morality. The plot should have left character alone, but he longed for that coupling, that mounting tension that would ultimately explosively be resolved. And then the sweet denouement, her letters jumbled, their handwritings intertwined as he slipped into unconsciousness. The plot was excitable that way. Plot savored the exposition and tried to quell his eagerness, but alas, Character was too close. Theme hissed its warning. Upon this dimensionless chalkboard, character would be, by unexpected circumstances, kept waiting a long time. Character struggled to undo her cursive lettering, unknotting the A's, uncrossing the T. Character became a line, curved, became a circle. Perhaps it was the lecture from last hour, the unerased equations, the name Edwin Abbott. As character left the chalkboard and floated into the room, she beheld a universe she could not imagine. The plot was revealed to her as a meaningless scribble reproduced 20 times in open spiral notebooks on desks in uniform rows, except one notebook. Character descended. Ed drew a caption balloon over Professor Slave's head. Within it, he scribbled script aimlessly, attempting to simulate Slave's handwriting. He quit sighed, closed his notebook, loosened his bow tie, finished his heavily sugared quintuple espresso in the stained paper cup. <gasps> At once he felt elevated, as if viewing the room from above where the even rows of desks made each student an intersection on a perfect grid. The professor was beginning to read aloud a story which he felt was flawless in its every aspect. <clears throat> Edmund slid his notebook into his briefcase, snapped the combination latches, exit lecture left. At last he understood his motive. He would write the story, the story that would bulldoze the artistic inventions of an incestuous and decadent civilization. He would wire the perfect fictive device, the narrative bomb that would level the school of English, that corrupt temple whose priests ordained only male homosexual cultural necrophilia. In the smoldering crater, a new order would be built. Gropius, Le Corbusier, right. The new walls would be a bulwark against the past. The explosion would be seen from space. He walked the railroad tracks to get home. He found them comforting. The linear strip of coal and gravel behind the storefronts and between the dilapidated warehouses was free of all pretensions. There were no billboards, no ornamental horticulture, no contrived neon elegance here. It was possible to think safely here. He could walk for blocks on a single rail, imagining his life had a single direction and perfect balance with no distractions, uncertainties, or reversals. Only the linear efficiency of a train which lumbered mechanically, without pause, between buildings, and over cross streets. 
Edmund paused on a bridge to ingest a wistful cigarette. Witnessing from above a beautiful couple pass in slow, languid autumnal steps, arm in arm through the bronze leaves littering the asphalt. They walk in twos or threes or more, while the light that hangs above the grocers investigates my face so rudely and my essays lying scattered on the floor fulfill their needs just by being there and my hand shakes my head hurts my voice sticks inside my throat i'm invisible and dumb and no one will recall me <clears throat> edmund coughed softly and ground the cigarette butt in the glass of shattered whiskey bottles scattered along the grease streaked rail glittering radioactive shards of the setting sun he had reached the midpoint of his journey and did not want to continue. Motivation was suspended by equal repulsion from his origin and destination. His relationship with his landlord, which existed on an irrevocable document and duplicate, had soured like the curdling milk in his malfunctioning refrigerator. He projected his hatred onto the leaky walls of his dwelling from which he would escape into the core of his imagination, some utopian swamp too thick to dredge for memories. He would wake up when the television station had signed off, feeling crushed by the ugly weight of imposed responsibilities to write papers for uninspiring pedants and checks to shifty reptilian and property owners. He swallowed some determination. He put his best foot forward and took the first step of a journey of a thousand miles. He would go home, finish his dishes, and write. Edmund got home, played it cool, lay low, kept his mind on the dishes until the last saucer was washed and set in his plastic rack to dry. Next trip to the store, he would begin using only paper plates and napkins, plastic silverware. His mind began to stray and eventually he could not keep away. And he sat down on one arm of the chair, picked up the remote control, and sighed with resignation. And eventually, he got comfortable in a bag of chips, and a can of dip, and a box of candy, and a can of soda. Wandered out to the living room and hopped into his lap. The ashtray positioned itself on the end table. Ed was set. His index finger coiled, ready to strike the button on the upper right of the remote control, which he leveled at the television. Downstate, a lot of engineers realized what happened and at maximum speed drew up blueprints to a large fissionium burning electrical generator and a demolition company was phoned and cranes converged on a greenhouse swinging their wrecking balls and the children could not hear their ballet instructors or piano teachers over the roar of the excavation equipment and with the help of a great number of their friends, the engineers built an enormous generator and then decided by unanimous agreement to pay for the construction costs by selling the electricity the power plant would generate and the engineers and workers elected from within them a president to oversee the financial aspects, number crunching work most of them found fairly tedious. And finally, everything was complete, and the workers cheered as a power cable was unrolled along poles to Edward's house, and at the center of his television screen, a speck grew into a rectangle of frying electrons. Edward changed the channel, and the president's grin faded, and he swallowed nervously, and quickly appointed a team of three electricians from within the plant to build a television station quickly, for soon Edward would have cycled through all the channels and realized nothing was on, and his evening would be ruined. So, working with amazing speed, the three electricians and a great number of their helpful friends drew plans, and then bulldozers converged on a library, and the children could not hear their physics teachers and biology professors above the cacophony of the demolition, and plans were drawn, and a television station was built, and cameras were wheeled into a studio, plugged in, and three of the braver workers climbed out of their bulldozers, combed their hair, and in front of the cameras began to read lines to one another off a teleprompter wire, wired directly to computer terminals at which three yet braver workers began typing scripts of a somewhat low quality, trying as they were to type the lines more quickly than the actors could read them. An exhausting task. They all took turns and Edward reached channel four and sighed with relief for here was a program. He smiled and ate another donut. The phone rang at the television station and one of the writers, phone pinched between the shoulder and ear as she continued typing, answered and was gently but firmly informed by the president of the power plant that the station owed quite a lot of money so the exhausted television station workers had a tense conversation and eventually decided by an appreciable majority to elect from within them a president to answer the phone and oversee the flow of money, a task most of them found tedious and futile. And they also decided to choose three of their workers to start a toy company that would manufacture and sell wooden horses for money that could be used to meet their electrical debts. Hey, at least we can advertise on television, one of them suggested suggested feasibly, so a team of three began to manufacture hobby horses in a back room by hand as they could not afford the power necessary to build a factory. At last there was a commercial and Edgar got up to go to the bathroom. <clears throat> After another hour, the toy company had not sold one handcrafted horse and could still not afford to pay the television station's admittedly high electrical bill. So after a calm and agreeable phone conversation, the president of the power plant and the president of the television station, both of whom had been elected by and from the workers, decided to appoint from within their organizations a central federal government with a judicial branch capable of resolving the matter in a fair and impartial court. 
They decided furthermore, in order to create a more balanced power structure, they'd appoint workers to fill an executive and legislative branch as well. And demolition equipment converged on a gymnasium, playground, and a swimming pool. And the children ran home crying. And the president of the new government quickly realized he would have to tax all citizens to accumulate money to pay the electrical bills. Much electricity was needed to heat the legislative arena and the domed Capitol building. And yet it did not seem right to tax the power plant and the television station. After all, they had appointed the government to defend their interests. And Edgar got up to answer the door. Because the mailman had arrived with the power bill and tax forms. After the tax had been put into effect, however, the power plant suddenly halved the rates they were charging the government to heat and light their buildings to half the rate it still charged a television station. It seemed right. After all, the power plant had appointed the government to protect its interests. The courts decided in favor of the power plant, but judiciously attempted to resolve the dilemma by creating a banking system with a president to loan the television station money so it could afford to build and power a rocking horse factory and a better studio in which to film the commercials. By now, as their organizations began to employ people from outside the original group of workers, the presidents of the power plant, the television station, the government, the banking system, and eventually even the president of the toy company could afford to take Sundays off, and they privately appointed a small company to build a golf course. Meanwhile, the president of the power plant was quietly informed by his newly appointed second in command that the power plant was rapidly depleting its available reserves of fissionium, and perhaps it would be in everyone's best interest that the president of the central government could be persuaded to, representing all of them, investigate the possibilities of importing fissionium from fissionium-rich regions to the south. Although, as he pointed out, negotiations would be impaired by the fact that the people of the south had no television sets and, therefore, no central government. The president of the central government and the president of the power plant met on the golf course to share cocktails and cigars and discuss the alternatives. The negotiations went smoothly and railroad tracks were laid so visionium could be imported in quantity while on the television station the government issued a bulletin stating that the executive branch was now recruiting workers to form an organization to defend their interests in the South. This bulletin somehow captured the attention of the viewing audience who knew very little about the South and the sales of model horses increased a notch. So, thus inspired, the president of the toy company and the president of the television station, who still had not met their electrical debts, one evening over cocktails and cigars decided that, in the interest of a rapt television viewing public, the two of them would themselves take a week to travel south to investigate, perhaps with a couple of microphones, maybe a camera. Edgar's last cola can warmed unopened. His cigarette burned itself into oblivion untouched. He leaned forwards, eyes widening. The president of the central government was very alarmed when he heard about the television broadcast, and the president of the power plant doubled the television station's rates, but the explosive footage from the south caused the sale of horses to rise so dramatically that the television station soon had no trouble keeping abreast of its debts, particularly as the majority of the people immediately decided to stop paying taxes, which allowed them all the more money to spend on toys. So the president of the central government and the president of the television station met on the golf course for cocktails and cigars. And in the roaring moral vacuum of these delirious, brawling orgies, any agreement could be made and understood, and understood to be secret. The writers were given stricter guidelines for television programs. <sighs> Edward sighed and changed the channel. Now it's time for the Sunday night news. <clears throat> As the president of the central government, I am here to respond to claims that I'm losing popularity. Uh, popularity? I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not astonished. I've been steadily raising the taxes I imposed when I attained office. I'm, it's, it's not my fault. I mean, after all, I was appointed, not elected. I, I don't understand what you people are getting at. However, I did bring along a few of my paintings to show you. <clears throat> well, yes, this one. You get the camera in pretty close here. This is hard to see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. This is a painting is called Neutron War. It's a painting which destroys power structures without harming any of the people. OK. This painting is, uh, this painting's called the Bomb Bomb. It's a weapon which only destroys weapons. Although none of these uh, weapons uh, are in existence, I have uh, hired a team of artists to work on the thought bomb, which will destroy all conclusions for a thousand years. Edward switched the television off, and the image dwindled to a speck, which pulsed slowly as it faded into blackness. The silence rushed him, pouring foamy waves through his conch ears, roaring tanks, airplanes, submarines, and a war-torn landscape strewn with shreds of anonymous enemy corpses. He was afraid to stir from the armchair the thumb of silence pressed him deep into. His skin was pierced by a thousand fish hooks, all connected to fishing twine, cast out windows and doors. He, he couldn't move without a line tightening and sweeping across a table and knocking over a lamp. A beetle had appeared on the arm of his chair. 
If Edmund destroyed it, would there be a devastating effect on the ecosystem? A widening radiance of malnutrition caused by a speck removed from a spider's future web? The insect thought this was all very silly and giggled, nibbling on a tiny bit of peanut butter that had spilled. Paralyzed, Edward lit a cigarette and inhaled deeply. and abruptly coughed both his lungs inside out, down the front of his shirt, bloody capillaries twitching. <coughs> With a choking wheeze, he re-inhaled them. <coughs> Edmund shut the television off. He slowly ground out his cigarette with a calm and desperate finality. It was time to cut himself free from the fishing poles. It was time to write the story. But first he had a letter to write, a letter to one grimp shrimp fisherman at the end of the fishing twine, glaring at gray seas before the flare of dawn's wet match lit the fog. Like he reminded me of some evil gnome. Shaking hands was like shaking a limp, wet, oily bone. Holding on for far too long. He took me in, he took me in. Said that I looked pale and thin. I told you a fact. His lips were thin and licking wet. His house was roofed and hot. In fact, it was a fucking slum. Scum! I could not look at him. Worm. I'd be taking a shower and who should walk in? Well, you're on the hit list. Thrust and twist, twist and screw, you gave me a bad review. And maybe you think it was all just water under the bridge. Well, my unfriend, I'm the type that holds a grudge. Dear Henry Bosnos, esteemed landlord, you have made it abundantly clear that you are willing to do anything to keep my apartment in perfect condition, as long as it doesn't involve any labor or expense on your part. Our relationship has lasted far too long, and by the time this letter reaches you, I'll have moved all my belongings out of that dilapidated, vermin-infested, electrical fire trap to which you adhere the generous label, apartment. Last night, your lawyer, Mr. Silverfish, walks into the restaurant where I work as a waiter. Here where I earn the money I give to you every month. Here where I win your bread. Here from where I bring home your bacon. Here where I earn your keep where I earn your living. I recognized him immediately by the wary distrust he inspired in me. He sidled nervously as though at any moment he might be attacked by birds, razor pigeon talons from above. I'll have to have you wait on me, he said. He did. That's very dominant of you, I replied politely, clearing away dishes from a place to sit down. What a slippery species. His hair gleams along smooth contours. He was wearing a snakeskin suit with a pelican feathered lining and a living silver fish for a tie. It hung from his collar, thrashing damply, flicking dew and rainbow beads. I accepted his cold, limp hand, and he inserted a tiny crab into my palm. Startled, I looked at it, a tiny twitching orange shell with his name embossed in silver letters. His business crab, very nice. I tossed it into a pot of boiling clam sauce in the kitchen and went to get his cocktail. Back, bow-tied and subservient table-side, I spouted, Would you like to start out with some artichoke scampi this evening? I rather think not. It's very polite of you to offer. Thank you. Do you plan to work in a restaurant your entire life? <clears throat> this is a good business, I interrupted. And by that, I mean not good business, but good business. These people actually want satisfied customers. Let me give you an example. A customer comes in. She doesn't like the food at all. We don't charge her. She walks. Now, you could say, you're just trying to ensure a decent reputation for yourselves. But if you think about it, we're a restaurant. If she didn't like the food, she's not going to come back anyway. But according to the logic employed by my landlord, your client, you, you should always charge them extra because that's the purpose of business. And if you can get away with it, charge them extra for being dissatisfied and then make them wait for their check. I consider the landlord immoral because he's unconcerned with my happiness and unwilling to cooperate even when our interests overlap. Unfortunately, this situation has little or nothing to do with morality. Morality is a cubist patchwork which only exists along its intersections where different people's moralities intersect or something like that. Anyway, I think this has to do with law. The law is my only friend right now. Good old American law, still upheld by occasional ungreased government palms dedicated to a naive altruism. Unfortunately, the law itself is only an interpretation of it. Um, the ancient decisions inscribed in dusty journals and echoing underground marble libraries where stiff sentries stand beside furled flags, and this is where I'll spend my evenings, alone at an enormous oak table, searching through the archives for the scrap of information that will lend me credibility. Somewhere, in very tiny print, there must be a law against being a leaky scum faucet like your client and, in all probability, yourself. Mm-hmm, he interrupted. He removed a shiny metal box from within his lapel, 
popped it, and from among several removed a frog, which he put in his mouth. So go get a lawyer. Give him my beeper number. He can join me at the spa and we'll look over your case. And he and I will have cocktails and decide which of us stands to win the most money. The other throws the case. We split up the take more or less evenly and both come out ahead. He offered me one. An amphibian, that is, not an equal portion of the take. I continued. So in court, instead of saying, the fact that my landlord broke into my apartment in broad daylight in order to do the only improvement since I moved in, which was to install a lock on the back door to which I do not have a key, aborts any sense of security or comfort I might have ever had in that apartment. Instead of saying that, I could say, according to Article 1, Column Q, this is a violation of human right 12B slash V, Volume 2, upheld Tenant versus Conspiracy, 1967. Plus, he's a leaky scum faucet. My calamari must be getting cold somewhere, he interrupted while I continued speaking, saying, I now fully appreciate that this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, though I refuse to believe I am a dog. When I first signed the lease, I did sort of the naive belief that when my landlord, oh, my poor cynical landlord, turned cold by a world out to rent him, when he discovered my diligent cleaning and maintenance efforts, he'd respond with a cooperative partnership. And I'll find out if there's any laws about that, too. From another shiny box, the lawyer removed a segment of dried python, clamped it in his lips, lit it with a flashy Ziffo trick. <coughs> Offered me one. I carefully refused. He spoke quietly. <coughs> yes, but the law doesn't exist. It's barely a framework. It's merely a connection of points. So connect the dots without numbers, stars without constellations. Like you said, a cubist patchwork, except the regulating lines are redrawn each time, each case. Now wipe that soliloquy off your face and go get my fried octopus rings, boy. Squid, sir. Go get my fried octopus rings, squid. Is this what the first mammal felt like in the age of big lizards? Scurrying for asylum, peering through frightened brown eyes from between the roots crossing in the bog, the swinging kitchen doors. I called him much later that night because I knew he'd charge you overtime for it later. I told him about a dream I had in which all the world was a derelict motel a thousand stories high, no upkeep, no innkeeper, no maid, no. Oh, never mind. I wrote because the apartment is being reclaimed by insects. Expeditions pass through an intersecting waves of multi antennae relentless attitude, emerging from the walls, stiff ballet poised on thin joints, remarkable escape from breaking incandescent bulb fixtures that are lightning like reabsorbed by the stove, and it's horrible. I want to turn on the oven as high as it'll go and watch them crawl out, burning back to their nests, burning, burning until all the insects who stuff the walls, serving as the only inefficient shifting, crawling insulation against October cold burn. And I smell smoke and calmly gather my typewriter and leave, leaving the front door open to walk to the tracks and hop in the belly of a slow moving boxcar to try my luck in New Orleans while the building I am still leased to rises up like a mountain of flame against the night, but no. Nope, I'm still here. <clears throat> I'll open a drawer and the bugs will startle crawling throughout my possessions. It's horrible. I've overcome my fear of large spiders. I saved one from drowning and brought it indoors. Like a virus, I transmit them everywhere in my schoolwork and now seven other buildings are infested. Any place I go, they send a few breeders concealed in my pants cuff and my hat who emerge and nature is reclaiming every building around here. The termites dwell in the structure points, carving scoops. The monstrous centipedes snake through the basement between the smoldering mounds of lumber and at night I hear the mother roach, a larvae 15 feet long iridescent in the moonlight, snoring through slitted vents in her flank in the basement. I twitch between these walls nervously because they are stuffed with bugs. An antennae emerges here, there, probing the light, probing the air. <clears throat> in conclusion, my dear slumlord, you have stuck, signed, and sealed a vacuum cleaner nozzle in my wallet. I am bound by contract to keep you in money in exchange for services that no longer exist the house that has been reclaimed by invertebrates of a dozen species. Please let me out of your lease. Please release me. Please release me. Please release me from that lease. Please release me speedily. I want to leave this lease. I am listless. Not a sublease, a lease release. Please free me from your lousy lease, Laos. Your absent tenant, Edmund. My building has every convenience. It's gonna make life easy for me. It's gonna be easy to get things done. I will relax along with my loved ones. Visit the building, take the highway, my friend. Come up and see me, I'll be working, working. But if you come visit, I'll put down what I'm doing. My friends are important. And don't you worry about me. Don't you worry about me. Don't you worry about me. I wouldn't worry about me.
Hugh, this is mind-boggling, but I think that piece you read to us was 23 minutes long. I think I may have gone a little over. Well, you don't want to go over now because you have a limo waiting and the champagne's getting cold. That's right. So we'll proceed with the questions. Yes, we have some very academic questions here. I know. Mr. Synopsis, is that your real hair? Mm. My client and I have no comment at this time. A fitting answer. I think so. I do too. Okay. Q, I found the story's tendency to zoom in on trivial details very exhilarating. Thanks. Would you say that this proves the design structure of your story is recursive? Um, wait, what does recursive mean? I didn't, did I you look it up? No, I didn't. What's recursive mean? I just don't know. No. No. Isn't he wonderful? I don't know. I thought the answer was yes. <laughs> Do you have anything to say, Q, to the youth of Illinois? <clears throat> yeah. Stop watching TV and go home. Prepare for a revolution. Um, do you have anything to say to the Illinois Student Loan Commission? I put the check in the mail this morning. Uh, stamp on it right Listen, there. Don't, 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 don't tell them too much, OK? Look, just, just keep your mouth yeah, shut. Don't say room. anything to those people. Room. They'll kill you. It's OK. Thank you for being with us on Works in Progress.